Part 6 of Astounding Stories, January 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Astounding Stories, Part 6 Phantoms of Reality by Ray Cummings. Chapter 1 Wall Street or the Open Road. When I was some fifteen years old, I once made the remark, Why, that's impossible! The man to whom I spoke was a scientist. He replied gently, My boy, when you are grown older and wiser, you will realize that nothing is impossible. Somehow that statement stayed with me. In our swift-moving, wonderful world I've seen it proven many times. They once thought it impossible to tell what lay across the broad, unknown Atlantic Ocean. They thought the vault of the heavens revolved around the earth. It was impossible for it to do anything else, because they could see it revolve. It was impossible, too, for anything to be alive and yet be so small that one might not see it. But the microscope proved the contrary or again, to talk beyond the normal range of the human voice was impossible, until the telephone came to show how simply and easily it might be done. I never forgot that physician's remark, and it was repeated to me some ten years later by my friend, Captain Derek Mason, on that memorable June night of 1929. My name is Charles Wilson. I was twenty-five that June of 1929, Although I had lived all my adult life in New York City, I had no relatives there and few friends. I had known Captain Mason for several years. Like myself, he seemed one who walked alone in life. He was an English gentleman, perhaps thirty years old. He had been stationed in the Bermudas, I understood, though he seldom spoke of it. I always felt that I had never seen so attractive a figure of a man as this Derek Mason. An English aristocrat he was, straight and tall and dark, and rather rakish, with a military swagger. He affected a small, black moustache. A handsome, debonair fellow, with an easy grace of manner, a modern d'Artagnan. In an earlier, less civilized age, he would have been expert with sword and stick, I could not doubt. A man who could capture the hearts of women with a look. He had always been to me a romantic figure, and a mystery that seemed to shroud him made him no less so. A friendship had sprung up between Derek Mason and me, perhaps because we were such opposite types. I am an American, of medium height and medium build, ruddy with sandy hair. Derek Mason was as meticulous of his clothes, his swagger uniforms, as the most perfect Beau Brummel. Not so myself. I am careless of dress and speech. I had not seen Derek Mason for at least a month when, one June afternoon, a note came from him. I went to his apartment at eight o'clock the same evening. Even about his home there seemed a mystery. He lived alone with one manservant. He had taken quarters in a high-class bachelor apartment building near Lower Fifth Avenue, at the edge of Greenwich Village. All of which, no doubt, was rational enough, but in this building he had chosen the lower apartment at the ground-floor level. It adjoined the cellar. It was built for the janitor, but Derek had taken it and fixed it up in luxurious fashion. Near it, in a corner of the cellar, he had boarded off a square space into a room. I understood vaguely that it was a chemical laboratory. He had never discussed it, nor had I ever been shown inside it. Unusual, mysterious enough, and that a captain of the British military should be an experimental scientist was even more unusual. Yet I had always believed that, for a year or two, Derek had been engaged in some sort of chemical or physical experiment. With all his military swagger, he had the precise, careful mode of thought characteristic of the man of scientific mind. 
I recall that when I got his note, with its few sentences bidding me come to see him, I had a premonition that it marked the beginning of something strange. As though the portals of a mystery were opening to me. Nothing is impossible. Nevertheless, I record these events into which I was plunged that June evening with a very natural reluctance. I expect no credibility. If this were the year 2000, my narrative doubtless would be tame enough. Yet in 1929 it can only be called a fantasy. Let it go at that. The fantasy of today is the sober truth of tomorrow. And by the day after it is a mere platitude. Our world moves swiftly. Derrick received me in his living room. He admitted me himself. He told me that his manservant was out. It was a small room, with leather-covered easy-chairs, rugs on its hardwood floor, and sober brown portieres at its door and windows. A brown parchment shade shrouded the electrolier on the table. It was the only light in the room. It cast its mellow sheen upon Derrick's lean, graceful figure as he flung himself down and produced cigarettes. He said, Charlie, I want a little talk with you. I've something to tell you, something to offer you. He held his lighter out to me, with its tiny blue alcohol flame under my cigarette, and I saw that his hand was trembling. But I don't understand what you mean, I protested. He retorted, I'm suggesting that you might be tired of being a clerk in a brokerage office. Tired of this humdrum world that we call civilization. Tired of Wall Street. I am, Derrick. Heavens, that's true enough. His eyes held me. He was smiling half whimsically. His voice was only half serious. Yet I could see, in the smoldering depths of those luminous dark eyes, a deadly seriousness that belied his smiling lips and his gay tone. He interrupted me with, And I offer you a chance for deeds of high adventuring, the romance of danger, of pitting your wits against villainy to make right triumph over wrong, and to win for yourself power and riches, and perhaps a fair lady. Derrick, you talk like a swashbuckler of the Middle Ages. I thought he would grin, but he turned suddenly solemn. I'm offering to make you henchman to a king, Charlie. King of what? Where? He spread his lean brown hands with a gesture. He shrugged. What matter? If you seek adventure, you can find it, somewhere. If you feel the lure of romance, it will come to you. I said, Henchman to a king? But still he would not smile. Yes, if I were king. I'm serious. Absolutely. In all this world there's no one who cares a damn about me. Not in this world. But... He checked himself. He went on. You are the same. You have no relatives? No, none that ever think of me. Nor a sweetheart, or have you? No, I smiled. Not yet. Maybe never. But... You are too interested in Wall Street to leave it for the open road?" He was sarcastic now. Or do you fear deeds of daring? Do you want to right a great wrong, rescue an oppressed people, overturn the tyranny of an evil monarch, and put your friend and the girl he loves upon the throne? Or do you want to go down to work as usual in the subway tomorrow morning? Are you afraid that in this process of becoming henchman to a king you may, perchance, get killed?" I matched his caustic tone. Let's hear it, Derrick. CHAPTER Two, THE CHALLENGE OF THE UNKNOWN Incredible! Impossible! I did not say it, though my thoughts were written on my face, no doubt. Derrick said quietly, "'Difficult to believe, Charlie? Yes, but it happens to be true. The girl I love is not of this world, but she lives nevertheless. I have seen her, talked with her. 
a slim little thing, beautiful. He sat staring. This is nothing supernatural, Charlie. Only the ignorant savages of our past call the unknown, the unusual, supernatural. We know better now. I said, This girl, he gestured, as I told you, I have for years been working on the theory that there is another world, existing here in this same space with us. The fourth dimension. Call it that if you like. I have found it, proved its existence. And this girl, her name is Hope, lives in it. Let me tell you about her and her people, shall I?" My heart was pounding so that it almost smothered me. Yes, Derek. She lives here, in this space we call New York City. She and her people use the same space at the same time that we use it. A different world from ours, existing here now with us, unseen by us, and we are unseen by them. A different form of matter, Charlie, as tangible to the people of the other realm as we are to our own world, humans like ourselves. He paused, but I could find no words to fill the gap, and presently he went on. Hope's world, coexisting here with us, is dependent upon us. They speak what we call English. They shadow us. I murmured, Phantoms of reality. Yes, a world very like ours, but primitive, where ours is civilized. He paused again. His eyes were staring past me as though he could see through the walls of the cellar room into great reaches of the unknown. What a strange mixture was this Derek Mason! What a strange compound of the cold reality of the scientist and the fancy of the romantic dreamer! Yet I wonder if that is not what science is. There is no romantic lover gawping at the moon who could have more romance in his soul or see in the moonlit eyes of his loved one more romance than the scientist finds in the wonders of his laboratory." Derek went on slowly. A primitive world, primitive nation, primitive passions. As I see it now, Charlie, as I know it to be, it seems as though perhaps Hope's world is merely a replica of ours, stripped to the primitive as though it might be the naked soul of our modern New York, ourselves as we really are, not as we pretend to be." He roused himself from his reverie. Hope's nation is ruled by a king, an emperor, if you like, a monarch, beset with the evils of luxury and ease, and wine and women. He is surrounded by his nobles, the idle aristocracy by virtue of their birth proclaiming themselves of too fine a clay to work. The crimson nobles, they are called. Because they affect crimson cloaks, and their beautiful women, voluptuous, sex-mad, are wont to bedeck themselves in veils and robes of crimson. And there are workers, toilers they call them, oppressed, downtrodden toilers, with hate for the nobles and the king smoldering within them. In France there was such a condition, and the bloody revolution came of it. It exists here now. Hope was born in the ranks of these toilers, but has risen by her grace and beauty to a position in the court of this graceless monarch." He leapt from his chair and began pacing the room. I sat silent, staring at him. So strange a thing. Impossible? I could not say that. I could only say, incredible to me. And as I framed the thought, I knew its incredibility was the very measure of my limited intelligence, my lack of knowledge. The vast unknown of nature, so vast that everything which was real to me, understandable to me, was a mere drop in the ocean of the existing unknown. Don't you understand me now? Derek added vehemently. I'm not talking fantasy. Cold reality. I found a way to transport myself, and you, into this different state of matter, into this other world. I've already made a test. I went there and stayed just for a few moments a night or so ago." It made my heart leap wildly. 
he went on. There is chaos there, smoldering revolution which, at any time, tonight perhaps, may burst into conflagration and destroy this wanton ruling class. He laughed harshly. In Hope's world, the workers are a primitive, ignorant people, superstitious. Like the peons of Mexico, they're all primed and ready to shout for any leader who sets himself up. My chance, our chance. He suddenly stopped his pacing and stood before me. Don't you feel the lure of it? The open road? The road is straight before me, and the red gods call for me. I'm going, Charlie, going tonight, and I want you to go with me. Will you? Would I go? The thing leapt like a menacing shadow risen solidly to confront me. Would I go? Suddenly there was before me the face of a girl, white, apprehensive. It seemed almost pleading. A face beautiful, with a mouth of parted red lips. A face framed in long, pale golden hair, with big staring blue eyes. Wistful eyes, wan with starlight. Eyes that seemed to plead. I thought, why, this is madness. I was not seeing this face with my eyes. There was nothing, no one here in the room with me but Derek. I knew it. The shadows about us were empty. I was conjuring the face only from Derek's words, making real that which existed only in my imagination. Yet I knew that in another realm, with my thoughts now bridging the gap, the girl was real. Would I go into the unknown? the quest of the unknown, the gauntlet of the unknown flung down now before me, as it was flung down before the ancient explorers who picked up its challenge and mounted the swaying decks of their little galleons and said, We'll go and see what lies off there in the unknown. That same lure was on me now. I heard my voice saying, Why, yes, I guess I'll go, Derek. Chapter 3 Into the Unknown We stood in the boarded room which was Derek's laboratory. Our preparations had been simple. Derek had made them all in advance. There was little left to do. The laboratory was a small room of board walls, board ceiling and floor. Windowless, with a single door opening into the cellar of the apartment house. Derek had locked the door after us as we entered. He said, I have sent my manservant away for a week. The people in the house here think I have gone away on a vacation. No one will miss us, Charlie, not for a time, anyway. No one would miss me, save my employers, and to them I would no doubt be small loss. We had put out the light in Derek's apartment and locked it carefully after us. This journey... I owned that I was trembling and frightened, yet a strange eagerness was on me. The cellar room was comfortably furnished. Rugs were on its floor. Whatever apparatus of a research laboratory had been here was removed now. But the evidence of it remained. Derek's long search for this secret, which now he was about to use. A row of board shelves at one side of the room showed where bottles and chemical apparatus had stood. A box of electrical tools and odds and ends of wire still lay discarded in a corner of the room. There was a tank of running water and gas connections, where no doubt Bunsen burners had been. Derek produced his apparatus. I sat on a small low couch against the wall and watched him as he stripped himself of his clothes. Around his waist he adjusted a wide, flat, wire-woven belt. A small box was fastened to it in the middle of the back. A wide, flat thing of metal, a quarter of an inch thick, and curved to fit his body. It was a storage battery of the vibratory current he was using. From the battery tiny threads of wire ran up his back to a wire necklace flat against his throat. Other wires extended down his arms to the wrists, still others down his legs to the ankles. 
a flat electrode was connected to the top of his head like a helmet. I was reminded as he stood there of medical charts of the human body, with the arterial system outlined. But when he dressed again and put on his jaunty captain's uniform, only the electrode clamped to his head and the thin wires dangling from it in the back were visible to disclose that there was anything unusual about him. He said smilingly, Don't stare at me like that. I took a grip on myself. This thing was frightening, now that I actually was embarked on it. Derek had explained to me briefly the workings of his apparatus. A vibratory electronic current, for which as yet he had no name, was stored in the small battery. He had said, There's nothing incomprehensible about this, Charlie. It's merely a changing of the vibration rate of the basic substance out of which our bodies are made. Vibration is the governing factor of all states of matter. In its essence, what we call substance is wholly intangible. That is already proven. A vortex, a whirlpool of nothingness. It creates a pseudo-substance which is the only material in the universe. And from this, by vibration, is built the complicated structure of things as we see and feel them to be, all dependent upon vibration. Everything is altered directly as the vibratory rate is changed. From the most tenuous gas to fluids to solids, throughout all the different states of matter the only fundamental difference is the rate of vibration. I understood the basic principle of this that he was explaining that now when this electronic current which he had captured and controlled was applied to our physical body, the vibration rate of every smallest and most minute particle of our physical being was altered. There is so little in the vast scale of natural phenomena of which our human senses are cognizant. Our eyes see the colors of the spectrum, from red to violet. But a vast, invisible world of color lies below the red of the rainbow. Physicists call it the infrared. And beyond the violet, another realm, the ultraviolet. With sound it is the same. Our audible range of sound is very small. There are sounds with too slow a vibratory rate for us to hear, and others too rapid. The differing vibratory rate from most tenuous gas to most substantial solid is all that we can perceive in this physical world of ours. Yet, of the whole, it is so very little. This other realm to which we are now going lay in the higher, more rapid vibratory scale. To us, by comparison, a more tenuous world, a shadow realm. I listened to Derek's words, but my mind was on the practicality of what lay ahead. An explorer, standing upon his ship, may watch his men bending the sails, raising the anchor but his mind flings out to the journey's end. We were soon ready. Derek wore his jaunty uniform. I wore my ordinary business suit. A magnetic field would be about us, so that in the transition anything in fairly close contact with our bodies was affected by the current. Derek said, I will go first, Charlie. But Derek... A fear greater than the trembling I had felt before leapt at me, left here alone, with no one on whom to depend. He spoke with careful casualness, but his eyes were burning me. Just sit there and watch. When I am gone, turn on the current as I showed you and come after me. I'll wait for you. Where? I stammered. He smiled faintly. Here, right here. I'm not going away, not going to move. I'll be here on the couch waiting for you. Terrifying words. He had lowered the couch, bending out its short legs until the frame of it rested on the board floor. He drew a chair up before it and seated me. He sat down on the couch. He said, Oh, one other thing. Just before you start, put out the light. We can't tell how long it will be before we return. Terrifying words. His right hand was on his left wrist where the tiny switch was placed. He smiled again. 
Good luck to us, Charlie. Good luck to us. The open road, the unknown. I sat there staring. He was partly in shadow. The room was very silent. Derek lay propped up on one elbow, his hand through the tiny switch. There was a breathless moment. Derek's face was set and white, but no whiter than my own, I was sure. His eyes were fixed on me. I saw him suddenly quiver and twitch a little. I murmured, Derek. At once he spoke to reassure me. I'm all right, Charlie. That was just the first feel of it. There was a faint quivering throb in the room, like a tiny distant dynamo throbbing. The current was surging over Derek. His legs twitched. A moment. The faint throbbing intensified. No louder, but rapid. Infinitely more rapid. A tiny throb. An aerial whine, faint as the whirring wings of a hummingbird. It went up the scale, ascending in pitch, until presently it was screaming with an aerial microscopic voice. But there seemed no change in Derek. His uniform was glowing a trifle, that was all. His face was composed now. He smiled, but did not speak. His eyes roved away from me, as though now he were seeing things that I could not see. Another moment. No change. Why, what was this? I blinked, gasped. There was a change. My gaze was fastened upon Derek's white face. White? It was more than white now. A silver sheen seemed to be coming to his skin. I think no more than a minute had passed. His face was glowing, shimmering. A transparent look was coming to it. A thinness, a sudden unsubstantiality. He dropped his elbow and lay on the couch, stretched at full length at my feet. His eyes were staring. And suddenly I realized that the face that held those staring eyes was erased. A shimmering apparition of Derek was stretched here before me. I could see through it now. Beneath the shimmering, blurred outlines of his body I could see the solid folds of the couch cover. A ghost of Derek here. An apparition. Fading. Dissipating. A gossamer outline of him, imponderable, intangible. I leapt to my feet, staring down over him. Derek! The shape of him did not move. Every instant it was more vaporous, more unreal. I thought, he's gone. No, he was still there. A white mist of his form on the couch, melting, dissipating in the light like a fog before sunshine. A wisp of it left, like a breath, and then there was nothing. I sat on the couch. I had put out the light. Around me the room was black. My fingers found the small switch at my wrist. I pressed it across its tiny arc. The first shock was slight, but infinitely strange. A shuddering, twitching sensation ran all over me. It made my head reel, swept a wave of nausea over me, a giddiness, a feeling that I was falling through darkness. I lay on the couch, bracing myself. The current was winding up its tiny scale. I could feel it now, a tiny throbbing, communicating itself to my physical being. And then, in a moment, I realized that my body was throbbing. The vibration of the current was communicating itself to the most minute cells of my body, an indescribable tiny quivering within me. Strange frightening, sickening at first. But the sickness passed, and in a moment I found it almost pleasant. I could see nothing. The room was wholly dark. I lay on my side on the couch, my eyes staring into the blackness around me. I could hear the humming of the current, and then it seemed to fade. Abruptly I felt a sense of lightness. My body, lying on the couch, 
pressed less heavily. I gripped my arm. I was solid, substantial as before. I touched the couch. It was the couch which was changing, not I. The couch cover queerly seemed to melt under my hand. The sense of my own lightness grew upon me. A lightness, a freedom pressed me, as though chains and shackles which all my life had encompassed me were falling away. A wild, queer freedom. I wondered where Derrick was. Had I arrived in the other realm? Was he here? I had no idea how much time had passed. A minute or two, perhaps. Or was I still in Derrick's laboratory? The darkness was as solid, impenetrable as ever. No, not quite dark. I saw something now. A glowing, misty outline around me. Then I saw that it was not the new, unknown realm, but still Derrick's room. A shadowy, spectral room, and the light which dimly illumined it was from outside. I lay puzzling, my own situation forgotten for the moment. The light came from overhead, in another room of the apartment house. I stared. Around me now was a dim vista of distance and vague, blurred, misty outlines of the apartment building above me. The shadowy world I had left now lay bare. There was a moment when I thought I could see far away across a spectral city street. The shadows of the great city were around me. They glowed, and then were gone. A hand gripped my arm in a solid grip. Derek's voice sounded. "'Are you all right?' "'Yes,' I murmured. The couch had faded. I was conscious that I had floated or drifted down a few inches to a new level. The level of the cellar floor beneath the couch. Cellar floor. It was not that now. Yet there was something solid here, a solid ground, and I was lying upon it, with Derek sitting beside me. I murmured again. Yes, I'm all right. My groping hand felt the ground. It was soil, with a growth of vegetation like a grass sward on it. Were we outdoors? It suddenly seemed so. I could feel soft, warm air on my face and had a sense of open distance around me. A light was growing, a vague, diffused light, as though day were swiftly coming upon us. I felt Derek fumbling at my wrist. That's all, Charlie. There was a slight shock. Derek was pulling me up beside him. I found myself on my feet, with light around me. I stood wavering, gripping Derek. It was as though I had closed my eyes, and now they were suddenly open. I was aware of daylight, color, and movement. A world of normality here, normal to me now, because I was part of it. The Realm of the Unknown End of Part 6